Um, my name is Justin Schmidt. I'd like to thank the, the panel for being here. Um, I think the objective of the panel is um, something about institutions making the leap, and I think there's some interesting imagery there. So I wanted to start off by just asking the members of the audience who are here as uh, on behalf of a, a family office, how many of you uh, have made an allocation or are thinking about making an allocation in stocks this year? Just raise your hand. No, no stocks? A stock, like equities, like, yeah, okay. It's, it's not a trick question. Uh, and the same for bonds? Okay, and how about for crypto? All right, okay, so there's actually some, some people here. Okay, so maybe the leap isn't such a, a, a big... Uh, um, okay, great, so um, let me introduce the panel, and starting to my right and to your right. Um, this is Laura Edelman. She manages business development at BACT, providing federal, like, federally regulated digital asset trading products and custody solutions, along with retail payments. She also leads financial sales, uh, financial sales team at the ICE. Um, next is Rain, who is on the other side. Uh, Rain Steinberg is the CEO and founder of ARCA, leading overall direction of the firm, and is responsible for securities structuring, risk management. Prior, Rain co-founded asset management company Wisdom Tree, being responsible for raising capital, creating intellectual property, and overseeing the sales team responsible for raising $50 billion in ETF 8UM. Next is Josh. Uh, Josh supports BizDev for Fidelity Digital Assets, which provides enterprise-grade digital asset solutions for institutional investors. Prior to Fidelity, he led coverage of public and private blockchain and crypto within uh, State Street's Emerging Technology Center and spent six years as a management consultant. And last but not least, we have Steve Kurz. Steve is head of digital, sorry, head of Asset Management and a member of the Executive Committee at Galaxy Digital. Prior, he co-founded Outer Realm VR, an enterprise-focused immersive software company, and was principal and head of BizDev at River Birch Capital, raising over $1 billion. Steve was a VP at Fortress and started his career at Lehman Brothers. Okay, great. So I guess let's just start at a, at a high level and let's talk about what kinds of strategies and investments are out there like how can how can someone get exposure to this space and i guess rain please so let's see if i can work off the microphone fantastic <laughs> um there are many strategies out there and um it's a really interesting time in this space it's kind of like the beginning of asset management um, all the things that we take for granted in our structured complete financial system don't really exist so I'm a passive ETF uh, indexing guy, went into crypto, um, but our first live product is a active hedge fund. Um, you know, passive price discovery relies on active eyes. Uh, the valuation metrics in this space aren't even determined. Uh, so we found a long only active strategy appropriate. Um, there's all sorts of things in this space that need to be recreated that we consider kind of commoditized in the traditional world, but are not in this space. They're hard to do costly and will take time, but on these uh, foundations, uh, those passive strategies will be built. So lots of strategies, but what you would think of as old, like fund of funds or active, is very different in this space, and there's a lot more uh, emphasis on operations. Uh, so uh, keep that in mind when you're evaluating strategies. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think. Um Crypto, if you're talking about cryptocurrencies versus sort of the blockchain element, which is uh, best, I think, accessed through a traditional VC model, um, is volatile as an asset class still. Uh, we think that volatility is going to go down, but today and historically that's been the case. And so, you know, our view at Galaxy is that you need to really focus on how can I best isolate the exposures that we want 
and mitigate risks in other places. In other words, the platforms that are offering these products today are still so new that you're taking not only volatile asset risk in terms of the cryptocurrencies, you're also taking potentially uh, counterparty risk or operational risk. And so we spend a lot of time of, on speaking with service providers and making sure that we're bringing um, traditional world players into the space through education so that you can mitigate those other risks and isolate the crypto risks. Um, I do think the point on passive is a fair one. Um, it's a hard space to pick winners and losers. Um, if you're a family office looking for a first exposure, uh, we'd advise you to size appropriately. Uh, we would advise you to be diversified, um, not sort of punting one uh, cryptocurrency around. Um, you know, we built an index with Bloomberg, the Bloomberg Galaxy Crypto Index, to provide diversified, um, uh, you know, sort of weightings to different cryptos and have a fund that tracks that. So we think that's an interesting uh, access point. And increasingly, there's more sophisticated strategies, whether they're venture or hedge fund uh, or opportunistic credit. Um, and so I think that product suite is growing very quickly. And the next six to 12 months are going to be uh, really interesting from a product development perspective. Great. Uh, Josh or Laura, you have a comment? OK. Um, so I guess the next question, I think, is you know, we see some problems in this space. I think we can all agree that there's some work to be done still. Um, what problems are you trying to solve? Um, and I guess, Josh, you'd like to start, and then Laura after. Yeah, I can start with that. Um, so we started looking at crypto at Fidelity about four or five years ago. Um, started experimenting with just the underlying technology. But we have access to you know, 450 family offices. We have access to pensions, endowments, um, you know, hedge funds that want allocation, wanted to make allocations in the space. Um, and we were constantly getting inbounds in, you know, through our branches or through, um, you know, through our relationship managers saying, hey, I want to buy crypto. I want to make an exposure to this new asset class. Can you tell me how I can do that? And we weren't comfortable you know, suggesting any of the solutions that were in the marketplace at the time. Um, storing a crypto asset is a very challenging thing to do. It requires either a high degree of um, technical capability or it requires an operational control unit within your organization, um, probably an insurance policy on top of that. And that's, that's not something that you know, people are underwriting from a cost perspective or we're willing to underwrite from, from a cost perspective to make a small allocation in the space. So we started really uh, diving into what does institutional custody look like? Um, and I think, you know, we're starting, to t we're starting to really think about how we bring that to market, um, and that's really probably the biggest problem. It's a problem that's been lauded by the SEC, it's been lauded by the SFC in Hong Kong. I think across the world you look and there's not an efficient way for institutions to safeguard these assets and hold them at an institution that they trust um, you know, with their other assets as well. And so custody is probably the biggest problem that we see in this space that, that needs to be solved. And that's, Really, where we started, um, you know, our journey into 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 safeguarding these assets and allowing customers who are, you know, using Fidelity um, to to store their digital assets with us. Hello. Oh, um, yeah. Just to follow up the, on the back of that, um, so Bact is going to um, provide a federally regulated um, ecosystem to seamlessly buy, sell and store securely the digital assets, um, similar to the fidelities of the world. Um, and it's, it's essentially what the space needs. Um, if you look at kind of the evolution of the space, starting off with retail and the influx of retail, and then um, looking uh, in the last couple of years, we've seen some prop shops who have their own money and their own coin, and maybe they're even mining. Um, and so there are, they've been involved from the beginning, and they're, they're involved already. Um, and then we're seeing the emergence of these crypto-only hedge funds that are also uh, involved in the space. But what backed, and I think what Fidelity is trying to solve for, is how do we get the rest of the financial institutions to come and feel confident in, this, in the playground? Um, and uh, Josh touched on a very important part. I mean, obviously, seamlessly buying and selling is important, but where do you store the store? The Bitcoin. So we're also going to um, we're launching our first trading product will be a uh, physically delivered futures contract, um, and so the delivery on settlement will be had on our in our backed warehouse, our custody solution. It will be regulated. That's what we're working on now. Um, secure, uh, it backed is backed by the Intercontinental Exchange, and which owns the New York Stock Exchange. So we're very familiar with cyber. 
um, security um, and uh, ways to prevent those things. So we've been working on this for quite a number of years as well, um, putting layers of protection, things like multi-sig, um, sh key sharding, um, you know, insurance on the cold and hot wallets, um, things that I think that you know are necessary for um, institution and, and traders that want to feel comfortable playing in the space, that want to play with it, instant size, essentially. And what, what's so exciting about Bact and Fidelity coming in is that um, the, the, the race has started with their entry into the market. Um, there's this institutional FOMO that we think is now starting to happen, right? That before, if you're at a big institution and you're, you're talking about crypto or digital assets or blockchain technology or any of these things, you're sort of saying, oh, we're, mon we're monitoring, this will happen uh, eventually. We've got a team focused on it. Maybe we have a labs group. Uh, now, the CEO of a company is, is pointing to his team and saying, why did they get there first? What are we doing? What's our response? And that's a very different psychology inside of an organization. And so we're really happy at Galaxy to see that happening because you need some of these big issues to be addressed before uh, a sovereign wealth fund is going to invest in one of our products or funds. Um, we actually think education continues to be the biggest single product, uh, sorry, not product, uh, uh, problem that needs to be solved. Um, if, you can, if you can understand risks, you can manage risks. And I think the crypto community a year ago did a very bad job of explaining not necessarily what a blockchain is or why, you know, why it matters within a computer science paradigm, but why does it matter to an investor? Why does it matter to a portfolio? What is it? What are the unknown unknowns? And how, how should you compare those to the mental models of the real world? There's not a lot of that thoughtful discussion that's happening uh, at least a year ago, and that's starting to change. And so we work very hard on the education side, and, and uh, we think that's going to be um, a process. It's going to take time, but that's the biggest skating item in our view. Yeah, I would just agree uh, quickly with that. Um, that education process isn't just about misunderstanding. Um, it's a very fragmented story, misunderstood. Um, there's a very fragmented audience. Um, these are narratives, and getting it right, everybody's starting with a different level in this. It's not a playbook of how to discuss with you. Um, every person in this room, I would probably have a very different conversation with how they approached. This is not an easy process, I would agree. Education, but also patience. Um, to address even the most nimble institutions, it's a much different uh, story and communication path than individuals in retail, and that's where the energy has been. Um, to understand your risks, to speak with them, that this is a very small part of your allocation, to understand all the other sides of your risk bucket, and to fit it into your work processes. Um, that is not what our space has been necessarily good at so far, um, but we will be getting better. Great, thank you all. So I, I guess that sort of brings up a great seg into like, what is the point of all this, right? Like, what are these use cases, right? So uh, we already have currencies, we already have commodities, right? What's, what's the exciting part about all this? Like, what do you see these assets being used for both today and tomorrow? And I guess, um, Laura, if you don't mind starting. Or, or anybody. <laughs> I can briefly speak about uh, how I got to crypto. Um, it was a systemic event that I found at Wisdom Tree, and that company, which is now very successful and 60 billion in assets, uh, was almost set, uh, sold for seven cents on the dollar during the financial crisis. Uh, systemic risk very much appeared on my radar. I didn't know about it, it knew about me. And this is the first type of technology that I thought could actually solve for that uh, concentration and centralized risk. Um, it also opened my eyes to that these are narratives, the things that we tell ourselves about value, um, what is underpinning value cash flows, these are just established narratives. Um, Bitcoin and crypto is a new narrative. It's young, it's less sticky, but that is the power of it. And that's why the communication path and education is very interesting. Um, it's not really solid, none of these things are, um, but this is actually waking people up to that and giving us an actual real answer um, to solve some of these things without sacrificing uh, you know, the efficiencies that we get through centralization. So that's my main interest. I can talk about my interest a little bit, and I, I apologize. Usually, I usually bring along a $10 million Zimbabwe in note that was issued in uh, June 2008 and was good for three months when I do these talks. But for us in the United States, it's very easy for us to trust the central bank, to trust the government that we're, uh, there, there's $10 trillion notes. <laughs> Yep. Well planted. <laughs> 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 
And so for us, right, we don't really care about the choice of, of where we go to get our currency. We know that our, we trust our financial institutions. We trust our government to be issuing money, although they're doing it at a rapid pace, and which, which could potentially cause you know, a, a severe um, credit bubble in the United States. But if you go beyond the US and you look at Venezuela, Argentina, um, countries where you know, it's really hard to either secure currency or you have fear of the government seizing your currency, I think the uniqueness of, of crypto is it's truly digital um, in the sense that it's censorship resistant. So not only can I send it to anyone at any point in time, but it can't be taken from me. Um, and I think that's a really powerful use case that you know we can't undermine the importance of. And I think to couple that with the simplicity of the solution, um, I've spent you know a number of years looking at the backend systems of the, f the firms that operate on Wall Street, and it's a it's a spaghetti network of systems that don't communicate well, that are written on you know languages that coders aren't even learning in school anymore. And right now, you know, we have the ability to program and, and rethink the way the entire financial system works on top of this technology that's attracting some of the smartest minds in the entire space to come and work on it. So, you know, use cases are still being solved. Um, there is the payments use case, there's a store of value use case, but at the end of the day, I think the, 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 the real picture here is how we replatform things that, have, that were built in the 70s and 80s and are, are ready for a digital economy to kind of take hold in order to transact value globally. Yeah, I agree with everything that's been said. I think taking a step back sort of categorically, there is um, there are three sort of components. There's the digitization of everything. That's not really sort of sexy from a crypto perspective. That's tokenizing assets. That's a digital wrapper on everything from your LP interests to art as a spectrum. Uh, and, that's, and that's interesting and it's a use case for a piece of this technology. Um, there is the internet 3.0 is one way you could describe it, but something like Ethereum, um, where you're just organizing information in a better way that was the way the internet was supposed to have been created, truly decentralized and um, leveraged in, any, in many interesting ways that the internet is not. Um, and then the third point is what, uh, what I think the question was about, which is use cases. And, and the two today are digital store of value, which is, you know, Bitcoin's taking the lead, uh, obviously, and then payments. Uh, and then there's decentralized to centralized within that payments use case, and that's a battle that's being fought um, and uh, will continue to be fought. Um, and the other use cases uh, will, will evolve as the space evolves, um, is, you know, two to three years out for many of the other ones. Yeah, yeah so I, th I think there's a, uh, I think it was Steve who brought up a great point about education. Um, and I think one of the, the challenges in this space is um, just getting access to quality, both news and data, and uh, really feeling like you understand what's going on. Um, and I was wondering for, for anybody on the panel, like um, what, what methods can people use that are getting into the space that are thinking about doing analysis for the first time or trying to find trusted news sources where they're actually getting something that they can, they can believe in and they can rely upon? And for me, I like to sort through a lot of the medium posts of reputable folks that are in the space. I know, for example, the CEO of BACT um, publishes a lot of our updates um, through Medium, and so if you follow her, you'll pretty much know exactly what's going on with us. Um, I, you know, the, the big publications, the CoinDesk and the Blocks and things like that of the world, um, are good to uh, receive email updates and, and kind of keep you on your toes as well. Uh, I'm sure everyone follows Twitter and all the ranting and raving on there. Some good, and you can weed through that as well. Uh, sure. Um, I would encourage all of those sources, but also um, if you're looking at this as an allocation um, to talk to people uh, that are investing in it, um, I encourage people that are looking at funds to really actually talk to fund-to-fund -to -fund people who are actually seeing hundreds of funds. Uh, the due diligence questions in this space are completely different uh, than the traditional world. All the systems are established in the traditional world, um, so the risks are really flipped. Um, it's less about your investment practice and more about a bunch of things that most people are not uh, qualified uh, to address. And actually, the more I know about crypto, it's so fast moving, unless you want to make it your entire life, um, if you want it to be a part of your allocation, I really would suggest talking to somebody who's looking at it uh, that carefully. 
I like to break data down in this space into kind of two components. One is really looking at the data on chain, and I think the technology allows you to see exactly, well, a very, to a very good snapshot of who's actually using Bitcoin, who's transacting in Bitcoin, what the price is across a number of different exchanges, and, and there are companies out there that are aggregating this data and, and building tools to allow investors to have a better sense of where the market's going or, or where uptick is. And, and one, of the, one of the companies I really like in that space is Coinmetrics. Um, and then, you know, I think another just a really important, um, a really important issue is, you know, this is early days for this asset class, right? This is, you know, 10 years in for Bitcoin, but really only three or four years of, of tradable data available. Um, I think a number of exchanges are, you know, have been purported for uh, falsely um, representing the, the volumes on their exchange. I think they have a financial incentive to do so. Um, and so looking at the work that, you know, Bitwise has done and, and Masari has done in order to kind of come up with a pricing system that actually, you know, filters out volume on exchanges that, you know, aren't meeting institutional standards is, is really important as well. And I think we'll start to see that, you know, matriculate more as the asset class develops to, you know, kind of come to this institutional level of being able to find best price, being able to use the on-chain data to evaluate kind of movements in the space, to see where upticks are and down, downturns are, and, and really come up with a not only a tradable snapshot, but also a use case snapshot based on seeing the data on-chain. Yeah, just briefly, if you haven't listened to Laura Shin's podcast, um, that's a great resource. She has two, uh, two podcasts, Unchained and Unconfirmed. They've got a, a trove of years of, of data on just about, not data, but podcasts that have interesting people um, talking about the issues that matter in the space. Uh, that, that's a great starting point. Um, Galaxy has our research posted publicly on our website. Uh, we, we write white papers um, that might be interesting for the group. And I would definitely echo the point here that uh, if you have an intermediary, whether it's a, you know, an RIA or whether it's a, a bank that you talk to or a, or a consultant, uh, ask them. A lot, in a lot of cases, they've spent more time on this than you think. Um, we've met with most of them multiple times and they're wrapping their heads around this and they're, they're looking for clients to come to them and ask for um, information. Uh, we also do education sessions uh, at Galaxy, both investment diligence and operational diligence that aren't commercial conversations but are just getting people up the curve and we're always happy to spend that time. Oh, okay, so Justin just uh, asked me to, to speak a little bit about um, the BACS payment side of the business. Um, so I sit on the institutional trading side, so I know very little, but I know high level uh, and enough to speak to it. Um, so essentially what they're putting together is um, an app on your phone where you can easily buy and store um, digital assets. Uh, we'll have a conversion layer so that, uh, and we've partnered with large companies such as Starbucks, Starbucks um, Microsoft, uh, Microsoft, and there will be plenty more um, large relationships uh, going forward to help us get embedded with these different um, brands that we're, um, you know, consumers are working with or spending money at uh, on a daily uh, daily basis. So essentially, the payments app itself is not nothing too new in the space, but I think the relationships are um, the fact that we're leveraging Starbucks and trying to answer or solve the problem of how can I go to buy a cup of coffee with a Bitcoin. Um, so you'll, you'll kind of download the app, we'll have the conversion layer, we'll convert it to USD, and then you'll be able to pull it into your Starbucks apps and um, buy during your Microsoft uh, games, not Fortnite, but the other one. There's Microsoft owns a game that's similar to Fortnite where a lot of transactions go on apparently. Um, and so that's, those are just a couple of use cases that we will um, broaden going forward. I got one. I think this is working. In. Okay, good. Um, yeah, and I, I think one thing that uh, frequently comes up is um, there's this you know large downturn where you know Bitcoin used to be X and now it's less than X. Um, and uh, one thing is um, you see much going on in the space continually. You know, it's, uh, there's this you know, sort of myth that Bitcoin is dead and that Bitcoin has died n number of times. Um, what do you guys see that is interesting and active and going on maybe behind the scenes that somebody that is not as uh, up to date on all the news and following in the weeds might not be knowing, uh, might not know about? 
Um, so I think there's a lot of interesting um, use cases going on with the blockchain technology itself. Um, right now, there's uh, many different blockchain technologies, uh, and, and there's companies like Cosmos and Polkadot who are creating an interoperability between the different blockchains, and that's going to solve the scalability issue that folks have been, or naysayers have been kind of talking about with blockchain. So the ability to let these um, chains uh, speak to each other, grow. Um, I know they've launched like an SDK kit. I think it's really important for the underlying technology to be um, uh, the user interface uh, needs to be something that we can all or you know easily grasp. So it's not just fintech companies that are using blockchain. Um, it's supply chain companies. Traceability is another use case that's really interesting. Where's your fish come from? You can track exactly the boat in the water and the location, and then the, tra the, the trail from which the, that fish has shipped to the restaurant, so the restaurant tour can see kind of where that's been. Same with quinoa and all these ancient grains that we're getting from Central and South America that are um, basically uh, the farmers that are growing them are not getting paid enough, um, barely getting by, and so the blockchain traceability um, at, uh, platforms are allowing us to look all the way back and make sure that, that that doesn't happen anymore. So there's a lot of interesting use cases for the underlying technology, and I think as that grows and then the confidence grows um, in, in the market, then you'll see more people coming in and being interested in it. I would say the interesting thing is a room like this. Um, we've seen a lot of energy from the technology side, the retail side. Uh, the energy has been less so, and rightly so, from the slow-moving institutional side. It has higher uh, requirements, uh, different risks, and you guys are gonna be the ones that drive the important um, you know, advancements in this space. Um, this is a type of gathering of people that are not necessarily technologists, not necessarily anarchists, um, but are becoming interested in making this an allocation in a serious portfolio. Uh, those questions and those needs will actually drive the adoption and really it's a chance to shape the financial system in a way that we really haven't had before in a very grassroots effort but with expertise and uh, a more democratic uh, vision so I find that very exciting. So we recently conducted a survey and we'll be publishing the re results of that at some point in the, in the next few months um, but within that survey we asked a wide swath of institutional investors what their sentiment was towards crypto, everything from would you invest in a passive product to do you hold it yourself to would you never touch it with a 10 foot pole. And we've done stuff, we've done sort of this, this client outreach in the past, um, but the, the results this time were pretty staggering. And without you know, quoting specific figures, over 50% of the institutions we talked to, which are you know, 400 of the world's largest pensions, endowments, family offices, hedge funds, uh, registered investment advisors, over 50% believe they will make an allocation to crypto in the next five years. So to me, that was an incredibly powerful statistic. Um, and not only, you know, with the different strategies that they would employ, but just, you know, the uptick from, I think, a year or two ago when we, we were, you know, looking at similar um, swath of people, the, the sentiment was much different. So I think, you know, we're seeing talent pour into this space in every single company. Um, we're seeing, you know, theses change kind of overnight. Um, and, you know, we're spending a lot of time dealing with institutions who actually care about, you know, making an allocation now. Um, and, and that's been, you know, that's really been shown in, in the survey results. So something that we'll, we'll publish soon, but something that we're very excited about and, and really showing the adoption of the asset class. Yeah, and in many ways, this is a this is a generational revolution. And so, uh, to echo this a little bit, we've met with uh, over 700 institutions in the last 12 months, um, and what we've what we've taken from that is a similar conclusion. And then some nuance that I would share with you is um, there is much more latent demand than you would expect, and the latent demand lives at the the 30-year-old level or the 35-year-old level or the 25-year-old level in those organizations. And the first time they brought up they brought up crypto or these you know funds a year ago, their boss or their committees laughed at them. The second time they brought it up, maybe they got laughed at again because the markets came down and you know that was that was the right move not to do it. But what started to settle in um, is an understanding of the inevitability of at least some of this. 
not all of it, not all of the altcoins, not a thousand ICOs and these kinds of things, but serious players who are offering real products uh, and educational services in the space. And so what we're starting to see is the barriers crack between that mid-level uh, who understands what this is and what it can be, more importantly, and then the committees who are more open-minded when they see uh, David Swenson invest uh, in, in a VC fund, as an example, uh, or Fidelity stepping into custody, as another example, and, and start to say that there's a there there, at least. And we don't know what that is yet, but we need to figure out what that is because it affects our existing portfolio. Uh, it could be something we put into our portfolio, or it could just be a new digital wrapper of how we you know, trade uh, our, our LP positions if we have LP stakes that we would like to get out of, as an example. So uh, we, we've, we've seen a lot more demand than what you would probably see from a price perspective, uh, and that has profound implications in terms of uh, money that we think will flow into the space. Um, and then the other side of it, uh, because it is generational, um, on the developer side, we've seen no abatement of excitement from young people entering into the space uh, globally who are solving the, the problems on the tech side from speed, scalability, security, et cetera. Um, and so that leaves us very encouraged. Um, since the beginning of the internet, that has pushed technology forward, and we think that's going to happen in blockchain uh, technology as well. So we have a few questions from the crowd, and I want to address those. First one is to Laura um, regarding BACT. So with using Bitcoin as a payment or purchasing items such as a latte at Starbucks using Bitcoin, that is effectively a taxable event. How are you addressing that? <laughs> um, that's a good question. I know that we, that's something that we had been talking about internally, but our, to be honest, our payments team is down in Atlanta and I'm, I'm not a part of that. I, I, I don't know what the answer to that question is, sorry. I, it's just, again, trading institutional gal. <laughs> okay. Uh, sorry. I, I think that there's probably resources. Um, I can go back and look and somehow circulate. I don't, I don't know. Uh, maybe on our, on our website. Yes. <laughs> It's, it's more of a general issue that comes up across regulation and laws that were kind of designed for segregate, segregated financial instruments that lived on exchanges or lived in determined buckets. Uh, these things cross over lines that are not clear on where they sit. So the regulatory bodies, our laws, are catching up to them. So capital gains on something that's a currency. Um, is it a security? All of these things um, were very clear when they lived in a place. They're not. Um, the regulatory bodies, the lawmakers are working at it, and people like this are actually helping with them. We're not anti-regulation, we're about clarity of regulation and making all of this work. But these are not uh, things that usually work quickly. It took us two years to get a equity ETF uh, through the SEC. That is a very different environment than it is now. Um, but they are adapting and they realize that they must adapt or you're gonna push everything to places like Malta. So they don't want to do that either. Um, so they're working on it, and we're getting regulatory clarity every day. Another question, and then we're going to wrap up this panel and head for a break. For institutional investors making an allocation the next two years, beyond Bitcoin, are there other cryptocurrencies that should be seriously considered? <laughs> I'll answer this briefly, yes. I don't know which ones. I would not make that recommendation. Um, these are like venture projects priced in real time. Um, there's all sorts of different considerations. I, that's why I really think a broad portfolio, either passive, um, you can have discussions about that, somebody actively looking at it, long short strategies, all of these things with active people looking at the valuations, evaluating teams, evaluating use cases, um, it's very early. Um, so I am not a Bitcoin maximalist, I believe greatly in it, but this is 10 years old. We're talking about disrupting financial systems and a centralization effort that's been maybe thousands of years. So very early days, um, treat it like that. That's one of the upside asymmetric risk um, reward aspects, but very early um, and be broad and consult professionals. Yeah, just to briefly touch on this, I think infrastructure is going to evolve around the Bitcoin, about, around Bitcoin right now first. Um, 
And so, I mean, what we see is, you know, when you look at the tail, it's a little bit more of a challenge from a custody perspective. The solutions that exist for the tail aren't necessarily there yet. The solutions that do exist for some of the larger, you know, more tradable assets are there. So something to just keep in mind when you're evaluating infrastructure is, you know, what is, what is, what are the tradable venues that I can go to? You know, are these venues doing KYC AML on their, on their participants? Um, and, and really, you know, the way I'd approach it is where, where is this coming from versus, you know, it, it, it's it, the ecosystem's going to evolve around the largest market cap tokens first. And that's, that's really what we've seen um, so far in this space. Yeah, we, we thought about this problem a lot when we were working with Bloomberg on the index. And from a construction perspective in terms of the index, uh, what, what, we, what we reflected on is uh, no one's smart enough to know the answer to that question today. There's, there's too many second and third order effects. What we do know is these are all networks. And networks, even when you look at things like social networks, disproportionately accrue value to the largest networks. And so what we were able to do with Bloomberg was define through exchange standards and minimum liquidity requirements um, a set of rules and parameters that bring in the largest, most liquid portion of the asset class. If that's five coins today, that's because those are five coins that meet those minimum thresholds. Uh, if there were 10 six months ago, it's because 10 met those thresholds. So in that portfolio or that index today, there are two blockchains, one payments company, and, and uh, Bitcoin, and then one Bitcoin equivalent, um, sized appropriately relative to the market cap weightings and the rules. Um, we think that's a, a, a smart way to build exposures, um, and, and it's because you can't predict where these things are going to go within a certain use case, and there will be multiple verticals uh, beyond just Bitcoin as a store of value. And with that, thank our institutional panel.